Well, it is a privilege again to have the opportunity to stand behind this pulpit and to share the Word of God with you. I am relieved to see the Board of Trustees and the President are not here. I thought that wasn't clear on whether that was going to happen or not. So a little more at ease addressing you and the fellow professors. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, the president did ask if I would continue on the theme of this week's message, and that has to do with the idea of our personal devotions helping us to live sinless lives. As he shared yesterday, that uh, failure in the ministry is more a slow leak than it is a blowout, as he shared that illustration about the tire. And it's our devotions growing cold and our relationships growing cold and our prayer life growing cold that leads to things that eventually will uh, cause uh, problems in our walk with Christ and problems in the ministry. It's not usually one big thing that all of a sudden explodes and out of nowhere we have a failure. So it's in that line of thinking that uh, I've uh, prepared my thoughts and today, if I can, I'm just going to take you on a personal uh, theological journey I've been on over the last several months. And it has, with this spiritual discipline in mind, the reading of God's Word to help us stay in a strong relationship. The actual text I'm going to read is from Psalm 119, verse 11. 119, verse 11, if you want to turn there just quickly. Your word I have hidden in my heart. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Shall we pray? Father, we love your word. We thank you. We are thankful for it. And we come to you today asking for ears to hear what the Spirit would say. Not what I would say, but what the Spirit would say through these words, these moments. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. It also seems that it wasn't that long ago I was a part of a panel up here and we were talking about Sabbath keeping and also scripture reading. And if you were there, you remember that my history with reading the Bible goes way back. I had a father that paid me and my siblings to read the Bible. Nice job, right? So a nickel a chapter, and if we read the chapter, came to him and asked a few, answered a few questions on that chapter, then he would give us a nickel. So I got paid early on as a kid to get familiar with the Word of God. Then in 1972, my pastor at my home church, when I was only about 14 years old, challenged the entire congregation to read the entire Bible through in one year with him. Well, I rose to that challenge. And in 1972, read it through in 72. And so I did. So in 1972, for the first time, I went and read uh, from Genesis to Revelation. And that pattern became a pattern, a life pattern for the uh, rest of my life. I did take a sabbatical during Bible college. Now, how heretical does that sound? <laughs> okay, so in Bible college, I did not read the Bible all the way through. My excuse was, I don't think I'm going to be void of Bible study during these next four years. So I'll have plenty of reading to do. I'll be reading books of the Bible, studying the Bible. So I'll take a little rest from the annual schedule and uh, just uh, focus on the reading and the study. So during the four years of Bible college, I did not read the Bible through in one year. But being the convicted sinner, backslider I was, upon graduation for the next several years, I read the Bible through every six months. So I could kind of get caught back up on that which I had failed or overlooked. So I was reading the Bible, post-graduation, post I was reading the Bible every six months. And a part of it was just getting familiar. I was going to earn my livelihood and spend my life teaching people this. I needed to be as aware of it as I possibly could. I also love the feeling or the thought that I'm not going to hear a sermon or a biblical question from any passage of Scripture that I have not personally read in the, next, in the last six months. All right? And so it's a pattern I've kept up, and uh, right now I'm working away again through the, the books of the Bible. And uh, just every day, every morning, getting up, reading the two or three chapters, and working my way through that. So 
the reading of God's word has been a lifelong journey for me. And so I stand here today wanting to reflect, though, on some of the latest lessons I'm learning. All right, so lesson number one, we do need to know the word of God. As David, the psalmist says, thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. It is, it is 1,500 pages. It's a lot to learn, and there's parts of it we have to know what we don't keep and what we do keep. And then you as a student will ask me a question class, and then I got a whole new study I have to do to figure out, do we tithe on the gross or the net? Do we tithe on gifts or on income? And I've got to go back. And, well, what? I don't know. What's the word say? Let me go back to the word. And I miss that. And it still is a ch- it's, it's still interesting to me, on however many times this is through the Bible, that I'll get to a passage and I will honestly in my heart say, that wasn't in there before. That wasn't in there. I never remember reading that. So I don't know if it was a drowsy moment every year for the last 17 years, but there are parts of Scripture that I still feel like a kid discovering for the very first time. And I want to just kind of take you, I, if, it's not so much a sermon today, it's just a walk with me over the last several months in this topic of the role of the Bible in helping me to be righteous. Now, the first step happened when I was in Numbers, okay? Just last month, I was reading through the book of Numbers in my annual Bible reading, and I get to this passage, On this day, you bring 13 bulls. On this day, you bring 12 bulls. On this day, you bring 11. And I'm reading through that, and it's like, Lord, just how much blood does it take to cover the sins of the the Jewish nation? And why did it take less blood the second day than it did the first day? And are you in heaven kind of watching over this and say, okay, just a little more blood, a little more. Okay, one more, one more. All right, that's enough. Your sins are covered. And it's like, were they committing less sins the second day than they were the first day so that you didn't have to have as many bulls the second day? And then the third day, they were getting more righteous, so they didn't have as many sins, so you didn't need as many blood of that that many bulls the third day. And it just dawned on me, it's like, it's not about the rules. It's not about the blood. It's about the obedience. And as I looked at those sacrificial laws and saw the details of it, it's not that it was this many ounces of, of the grain and this many bulls' bloods that actually reached the quota to have the sins forgiven. It was that the creator of heaven and earth who had delivered them from Egypt was now wanting to see how special am I to you? How close will you pay attention to what I want you to do? It really was a test of how, not whether you keep the rules, but whether you listen closely to me and how you look at me as your creator and savior and redeemer. Well, that was a little tough. That's almost heretical. That's almost like, am I allowed to think that thought? Am I allowed to think that these rules don't matter? It's just if we're paying attention. But that seemed to be the conclusion, and I had a chance over spring break to see my son-in-law, who's a Ph.D. candidate at Baylor, and he works on the Old Testament. So I came to him and I said, hey, I was just reading this passage, and it seems to me that it didn't really rely on the exact number of bulls as much as it relied upon them paying attention to the detail of the instructions and following them. If they would pay clear attention to the details and following that, God was reading something into that obedience beyond that the quota of blood was met. I mean something to these people. They are following my laws to the jot and the tittle. What, it, what happened if it was one less bull? What happened if one of the lambs had a blemish? Would God notice? 
Yes. But what would have mattered to God is if the people had noticed and offered it anyway. What happens if the creator of heaven and earth who has delivered you from the land of Egypt sees that you don't give a rip about what he thinks? Maybe you do give a rip, but only on certain days. Maybe you kind of care 90% about what he thinks, but the ever little jot and tittle, that, that's a little too much there, and I can't go all the way that way with you, so I'll do part of it. So the Old Testament law is a challenge to me, and it was really an interesting. So when I brought it up to my son-in-law, hoping he would give me wisdom, he took me to the passage in Isaiah. If you'll turn there and just let's read this one together. Isaiah chapter 1. In Isaiah chapter 1, he had just started a small group study and they were looking at the book of Isaiah. And so he told me, he said, I'm not really a specialist in the sacrificial laws of the Old Testament in my area of study, but we're just starting a study in the book of Isaiah in our small group, and in chapter 1, here is this statement, verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. What? What? <laughs> you just told us 13 bulls, 12 bulls, 11 bulls, 10 bulls. What? That's not the point. Verse 12, when you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths that you're keeping, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. Wait a second. You told us to do that. So I am walking through this journey, and I'm realizing that while the word of God is a goal for me to learn it and to memorize it and study it it will help me to keep from sinning now as I'm reading through the Old Testament this year I'm realizing the, the rules are not the point the point is the way you obey the rules the attitude in which you obey the rules the details in which you obey the rules says something to God that he is looking for he's not looking for the 13th bull, he's looking that you paid attention to what he asked you to do and brought 13 bulls. I tell you, this whole thing of rules and laws are just tough. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, have, uh, I used to like the show Cops, and I, I don't watch it anymore. It's just too many gross people on it. But I have turned to the law enforcement for the game wardens. Uh, Lone Star Law, Northwoods Law. I love Northwoods Law. It's right up here. It's New Hampshire and it's Maine and it's it's. I know. I've been there. I, oh, Hampton Beach. I've been there. You know, and I'm watching these guys. But if if you've ever watched that show, the the rules that they have for hunting and fishing are a pain. I I if you don't do that, you don't know how detailed it is. But do you know that when you go hunting for certain birds, you are only allowed to have two, or you're only allowed to have three shotgun shells in your shotgun. But most shotguns are manufactured to hold four or five shells. But even if you're a law-abiding citizen and you only put your three shells in your shotgun that will hold four or five shells, you are hunting legally, but your weapon is illegal. And you can get a ticket. So you have to put a plug that's about the size of one or two shells in your rifle that are blanks that will never shoot 
so that your rifle can only hold three shells and now you're legal. Do you know that when you go uh, hunting, that uh, if you have permission on somebody's land to hunt an animal and you find one and you shoot it, but before it dies, it runs off of their property onto somebody else's property, you can't go get it until you get permission from that person. They had one on this last week who shot a elk, a moose, a moose was in Canada, and the, the moose ran into the United States. <laughs> into New Hampshire, and they actually had to bring a dog, and uh, I turned it off and went to bed, so I don't know how it ended, but the dog was both able to track human tracks and animal tracks, so they were going to both test if they could find where the animal died in New Hampshire, and also test if the people came across the border going to look for it, and then went back and gave up and did the right thing, all right, so... Do you know that in, in Louisiana and Texas, you can, you can fish for shrimp, but only when the sun's up? And do you know that every day the sun comes up at a different time? And even if where you are on the boat, you can't see the sunrise because there's trees in the way, you can still fish because the time of the sunrise has already happened. Such details. Poor President Shuttlesworth <laughs> found out that somebody down in Augusta, Maine, made a rule that you can't drive with ice on top of your SUV, and nobody told him about it. But he found out ignorance of the law is no excuse. Right? He shared with us yesterday, he, he was coming down here like midnight, 1 in the morning, and got stopped because he had ice on the top of his Suburban and had to chip that off with no gloves before the patrolman would let him continue on the trip. I understand it's a hazard. It makes sense to somebody, but you got to tell somebody. And those rules are always changing. So thank God we have rules <laughs> that don't change. Okay? There's not a moving target here. We just have to know what the Word of God says, and your regular Bible reading will help you to become someone who will learn those laws and then can obey them. So here's, here's the points we're making so far. Number one. I need to learn the word of God so that I can obey his word. The second thing we're learning that is equal as obeying, uh, knowing the law, is the act that we're willing to obey him. It's not the law that makes me holy and righteous. It's the willingness to obey the law that makes me holy and, holy and righteous. That I recognize not just the law, but the law giver behind the law. Now, the next thing that happened on my journey is I'm on the preaching team at Hope Church where Pastor Laura Lee Crabtree is the pastor, and we're doing a series right now on uh, the disciples, biographical sketches on the disciples. And I was assigned Matthew. And... Uh, in the passage where Matthew is called to be a disciple, I want to read that with you. Let's go to Matthew chapter 9. And begin reading with verse 9. As Jesus passed by on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that Matthew, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners 
to repentance. I've read the Bible enough when I see a phrase, now go and learn what this means. I want to go and learn what this means. It's like, oh, I'm given a very clear direction. There's something hidden here that needs to be found. So in verse 13, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. This brought me to a next part of my journey here on figuring out what the role of reading and knowing God's word has in my life. And that is the issue that when I realize that I have to learn the word of God and obey it, that brings a certain challenge to me. Let me just, let me just uh, do this test. If you'll turn to the person next to you, okay, and I want you to, I want you to share with them. All right, let's go back to the text. Your word I have hid in my heart that my, I might not sin against you. Would you share with your neighbor something in God's word that you have learned that has helped you to live a righteous life? Okay, which rule have you learned in God's word that you're practicing and you feel that that is helping you to live a righteous life? All right, just go ahead and take a minute and share that with the person next to you. All right. Just one rule. Just one rule. (laughs) You don't have to go through the whole Ten Commandments. Just okay. All right. Now that you are on record for saying what that uh, rule is, you've learned from Scripture that has helped you to not sin. I want you to ask answer this question for me. It was that an Old Testament rule or a New Testament rule? Okay, the rule that you shared, raise your hand now in just a second. If it's a New Testament, why don't you raise your hand? Then if it was Old Testament. The rule that you've learned from Scripture that helps you to live a righteous life, if it was from the New Testament, raise your hand. Okay, all right. If it was from the Old Testament, raise your hand. Oh, what do you think? A little more on the New Testament than the Old Testament? All right, so, oh, it's in both. All right, okay. Yeah, that do not murder is really helpful in both testaments. Because <laughs> there have been times. <laughs> All right. In context, let's do our biblical context. The psalmist is writing in which testament? So what he is saying, thy word, he's referring to what? The Torah, the law, the sacrifices, all those details. I, your word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. He didn't even know the New Testament rules yet. He seemed to know the spirit of the New Testament, but not the laws yet of the New Testament. So he is saying the detailed, nitpicky rules that we follow, I have hidden those in my heart because I don't want to sin against you. You today are hiding the word of God in your heart so you may not sin against you, that you may not sin against him. How you doing? The word of God that you know that you have hidden in your heart, you've internalized and you are doing those things so you may not sin against him. How are you doing? A scale one to ten. How you? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, it depends. De- depend which rule that I've hidden in my heart, right? Okay. And here's here's why I'm kind of coming into the Matthew uh, phase or chapter of this journey for me is there are some rules that uh, I've learned in Scripture that I I really have mastered. Okay. I I have taken uh, a humble pride 
in the fact that uh, in my, my whole life to this point, I have never been tempted, have never yielded to an offer to drink alcohol. Uh, it doesn't hold an enticement to me. Uh, it doesn't smell good to me. Uh, it doesn't have anything that it offers me that I feel like I need. And so alcohol has never uh, been something that I've partaken in, and it's never been something that really had a fascination to me. Um, illicit drugs, same thing. I was raised in a chiropractor's home, so I'm actually suspicious of aspirin. Okay, let alone those more powerful things, okay? So drugs have never been an enticement to me. Alcohol has never been an enticement to me. And as I am sharing that with you, I want to see if you're kind of picking up in my expressions here that when it comes to alcohol and to drugs, I don't need God's help. To resist those things. Do you have areas in your life like that? Oh, those are those are not temptations to me. I, you know, pornography is not a temptation. I know a lot of people say it is not a temptation for me. Praise God. You know, all of us seem to struggle with some sins more than others. That means there are some sins that we don't seem to struggle with. And I see in Matthew's story this hint that if we are not careful, some of the areas where we don't have challenges or struggles, we actually may take on the attitude of the Pharisees. Uh, God, in this particular era of my life, you can have the day off. I got it. Now, that's, that's the next point I want us to deal with. Can, can, the danger of hiding his word in our heart that we may not sin against him can actually give way to us being tempted to become pharisaical. If we hide some of his word and law in our heart and we master it so well that we may be led into the temptation of thinking, I don't need the Holy Spirit's help here in this area I am a success. In this area, there are no temptations. I have no weaknesses in this area, so I don't need the Holy Spirit's help. That becomes its own challenge. So what do I do, Dr. Wooten? I, I'm supposed to study the Word of God so that I don't sin against Him. There's so much to learn, and yet now you're telling me if I get some things learned so well that I can master them, then that becomes its own danger. How do I walk this? You know what? Maybe what I should do is just not, not study the Word. Because if I don't know all those rules, then I can't be guilty of breaking them because I didn't know they existed. Okay, we can ask President Shuttlesworth, is ignorance of the law an excuse? <laughs> no. Augusta makes that rule, but he's still responsible for it. Nobody mailed him or told him, but he's still responsible for it. The rules and the law of God's heart and his will that are in the scripture, you may not have read them yet, but we're going to be responsible for them. creator of heaven and earth, the one who gave you life, the one who saved your soul, has laid out some ways that he would like for you to behave, and you haven't even bothered reading it. Well, why read it? Because I can't do it. Okay, let me bring it to Matthew and, and wrap up here. In Matthew... Jesus is telling those who are wondering why he's hanging out with sinners that he desires mercy and not sacrifice. What's sacrifice? 
That's the human behavior that will help cover our sins. We make sacrifices and we, we obey the rules and we follow the laws and we do everything right to the point where we know that we've checked everything off of the, every box. So now we can say, I should be forgiven of that because done, I've done everything that I needed to do. That's the pharisaical spirit. So on the one hand, we don't want to become so, so uh, ascetic, so self-punishing that we feel like we've paid the price to be forgiven that we overlook that God is still necessary in our righteousness. I don't care how many ways you honor the Sabbath you're still going to need the Holy Spirit to help you honor that day above all others. We're all going to need the Holy Spirit. So if we, could, if we could attain righteousness in our own strength, then we could brag. So the danger of hiding the word of God in your heart so that you may not sin against him is to be open to the temptation that if I do that, then I... I did, my, I did my own righteousness. So we want to study it so that we know and pursue that, but always with the understanding that I can never perfectly attain it unless the Holy Spirit shows up and closes that last gap. Neither can I say, well, if the Holy Spirit's the one that's responsible, then I don't have to do anything. I'm talking a partnership here. We read the word of God to know what the creator of heaven and earth who gave us life, who gave his son on our behalf, would like to see in our lives the behavior and the attitudes that would be conducive for us being testimonies and witnesses for him. We pursue those things, everyone we can, everything we discover, everyone we read about, knowing that in our own strength, we will never always ever successfully complete those. In our own strength, it is impossible. In the flesh, it is impossible to please God. So that means, Dr. Wooten, that in every area of my obedience, the Holy Spirit has to show up. Jesus has to show up and forgive me and close that gap and be the bridge between me and the, and the standard of righteousness. Yes, The more you realize how many rules there are and the more you realize that the Holy Spirit and Jesus have to show up on every one of those no matter how hard you try to close the gap, the more grateful you will become for the grace of God, for the mercy of God. So when Jesus tells those at Matthew's house, I desire mercy, and not sacrifice. So as I was preparing last Sunday's sermon, Dr. Crabtree, I, I'm working through this. What is, what's it? He wants mercy and not sacrifice. How can I be merciful? No, he's being merciful to me. I, I would prefer that you left room for me to be merciful than you worked all that you could in every area of every rule and feel like you attained and now you you deserve to be forgiven. I want to walk with you in mercy. I don't want to walk with you in sacrifices. I want to walk where you realize that I am worthy to be listened to, but that the standard is so high you won't reach it unless you lean into me. Unless my mercy is allowed to close the gap you will never walk in righteousness unless my grace it comes in and pulls you that last step of the way you will never walk in perfect righteousness so what is the role of the word of god in helping us to be righteous it should be a lifelong pursuit of ours to know the heart and the will of god to understand what behaviors and attitudes represent him well he's not telling us to do these things and he doesn't do them he's telling us to do these things because he is these attitudes he is attitudes he is these actions and he's asking us to represent him every area that we can figure out to be more like christ we need to explore it 
every area where we can find out where he wants us to act like him, we need to pursue that. But always with the understanding that we can never achieve it unless we leave room for him to close the gap. Thy word I have hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. Not that I can be 100% perfect, but as I show you that I'm willing to listen to you, creator of heaven and earth, forgiver of my sins, savior of my soul, and then lean into you to close that gap, then I'll know that I have walked after your will and after your heart. What's the role of the law? Yeah, I kind of feel like I'm right where Paul is when he writes, writes Romans. Should we sin so that grace may abound? No. What purpose is the law? It just taught me what being bad was. I know. There is a balance. And if we take it too far, we become pharisaical. If we take it not far enough, we become lazy and guilty. We need to do what we can. I know you got other tests to study for, other papers to write, but even in Bible college, we need to realize that the study of God's word that we are doing has a goal and a purpose, that we can become more pleasing to him, yet never being able to attain righteousness unless he steps in and closes the gap. And day after day in my life, he closes the gap. Today, he's closing the gap. Tomorrow, if I survive today, he will close the gap. Every day of my life, he is there to close the gap between my human efforts, my frail attempts to obey him and show him I love him and show, them, show him that I honor him for who he is, that I am grateful that he has revealed mysteries of eternity to me in this book. He let me know that there's a heaven and a hell. I wouldn't know that if he didn't write it down in this book. To let me know that there's a Holy Spirit to empower and help me to live victorious in this life. Even though I can't attain perfection through him, I am righteous. The word of God is our tutor. And it better lead you to Jesus. And it better lead you to the Holy Spirit. Not standing in your own strength, but standing in his grace. He wants mercy, not sacrifice. So let's meet him halfway. Let's do all that we can do and then trust him to close the gap. Will you stand with me, please? Heavenly Father. We've said it so many times, we are grateful for your word. We have a tremendous advantage over those who will not read scripture in that we do. Your word reveals your heart and your will, your plans and your love for us. It helps us to realize potential in our lives that we could never even dream of and at the same time reminds us that we are completely dependent upon your grace. Lord, help us to walk in that balance. Help us to hunger and thirst for your word. Help us to read and study until we find new ways to act and think and believe like you do. But never to trust our own strength. To lean into your Holy Spirit and to your son's forgiveness to walk in their strength, grateful for the amazing grace, amazing grace, amazing grace of Jesus Christ to our lives and our hearts. We will thank you and we will praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.